park or she has to walk home. Y'all know that's going to work out right, right? I keep forgetting we're on Facebook. But anyway, <laughs> just a joke, y'all, just a joke. And um, she goes through, she's through, and then we'll be done. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time. Thank you so much, God, for your mercy and for your grace. Will you say amen, church? Thank you, God, for the way you, you watch over everything. We had a lot of water here yesterday. We had no damage. So we just thank you for watching over things. And, and God, we just honor your presence so much. You know, when we come into a meeting like this, all of us have our own personal things that we're going through, things that may be happening with us and in us, and nobody else sees us the way you do, that you're able to minister to this specific need. So Holy Spirit, we, we just give you permission to speak through the speaker, touch through the speaker, and God just minister to the needs of the people. Yes. Whatever the struggle is, set us free. Amen? And Father, we honor you and we honor your presence. You got to take authority over demonic influences that can blind the minds of people so they don't hear, so they don't see. In the name of Jesus, I command you to release them. And I thank you for freedom in this place. In Jesus' name, would you say amen if you agree? Amen. 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 Why don't you uh, be seated? Offering King, take up the offering. It's on you. He labeled himself that, y'all. I didn't do that. So, but we let it. We let it go. And um, Pam, why don't you make your way on up here? You coming? Yeah. Are you ready? Let's get a test on our microphone real quick. Test. 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 Testing. Testing. Test. Testing. Test. She's gonna give her a hand, y'all. She's gonna teach the word to you. Amen. Good evening. Glad you're here. Amen. Amen. I have a disclaimer before I start. <laughs> We're on chapter 12, an anxious and worried mind. And you know, in today's world, we're very tempted to have an anxious and worried mind. There's a lot going on. So I just, my disclaimer is just this. Of course, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fall into that anxiety, that worry. But at the same time, this is just my disclaimer. We could say, okay, well, this is going on in the world. They're teaching this stuff at school. I'm not going to worry about it. So there's this fine line to where, yeah, you don't worry about things, but sometimes you got to take action about things. Okay, so that's my disclaimer. Today, as I was kind of meditating on this, I said, you know, yeah, we're not supposed to worry. But there are things out there, especially today, that we need to take action on. Okay, so the, there's a big difference between worry and taking action on things, you know, speaking out about things that are going on that we need to speak out about. It doesn't mean you're worrying, okay? So just that's my little disclaimer. Okay, so an anxious and worried mind. I couldn't have had a better chapter because since the first of the year, I have really battled an anxious and worried mind. I really have, and um, I didn't even talk to Rick about this until about two weeks ago, that, I mean, literally since the first of the year, the devil just really bothers me <laughs> with an anxious and a worried mind, and I have to cast it down. I, I know how to do that, but it's also a battlefield of the mind, and I'm so grateful for this book. Like I've told you many times, I've read it numerous times. It never hurts to read it again. This, this study has been tremendous um, because to me, and I was telling Rick a couple weeks ago, this book actually builds precept upon precept. You know how the Bible, you know, you hear a lot of it over and over again, but that's what reading the word does. We read things over and over again, but that's how we grow. That's how we learn, you know, from the word by hearing it over and over again. That's how faith comes. Hallelujah. So anxiety and worry are both attacks on the mind. Anybody differ, uh, disagree with that? Because they are an attack on the mind. And as we know, this whole series is about the battlefield we have in our minds. And she makes a statement that says, it is absolutely impossible to worry 
and live in peace at the same time. Have you found that true in your life? If you're worrying, you're not in peace. They are total, complete opposites. Two ends of the spectrum. You can't do both. You can't be in peace and have worry in your mind. And something about peace, remember that peace is a fruit of the Spirit. And God gives us that. But how does it come? How does the fruit of the Spirit come? It comes from abiding in Him. So we have peace, okay? And the more we abide in Him, He's given us that peace. But we have to make a choice. Are we going to draw on that peace or not? It's like with a lot of things in our life. We have to make a choice. Choose life. Okay? We can walk around talking death. We can talk, walk around talking life. Choose life. Same way with peace. We can choose worry or we can choose peace. So it's to, you know, totally up to you. God has granted us that peace. It's the fruit of the Spirit. That fruit grows in us as we abide in Jesus. So just real important there that we abide in him, that we've got to be in his word, that we've got to be doing the things he wants us to do and, and abiding in that peace, abiding in Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, the Bible, there are different translations. She talks about worry. So the, new, um, the King James never uses the word, the actual word worry. It uses things like take no thought, be careful for nothing, casting all your care all those things in the word is don't worry and i look at the more i look at and you'll see this in the scriptures that we go through tonight that it says you know do not worry basically i look at that as the command because jesus isn't saying please don't worry you know he's not going you know try not to worry he's saying do not worry and i always look at when i read that in the bible i look at that as the command from him that we are not to worry so we're supposed to be choosing that peace over that worry every time. So Webster defines the word worry as to feel uneasy or troubled, to cause to feel anxious, distressed, or troubled, a source of nagging concern, or to torment oneself with disturbing thoughts. None of that sounds very appetizing, does it? I mean, none of it's good. Anybody want to live there, <laughs> you know, constantly feeling uneasy or troubled? Th those are terrible feelings to have that uneasiness, that troubleness, that always feel anxious. I don't want to live there. And um, they just don't sound like things that godly people need to be doing. Amen? She talks about in one, um, the Random House Unabridged Dictionary, that the definition actually says to seize by the throat with teeth and shake or mangle as an animal does to another animal or to harass by repeated biting and snapping. Now that sounds really horrendous when you think about the word worry. I mean, having, you know, just picture a dog fight, if you will. Imagine that. I was going to put one up on the screen, but I decided not. Nah, that might be um, rated R or something. <laughs> Not suitable for our audience tonight. <laughs> but you can picture it, can't you? You can picture a dog fight and how animals do grab for the throat. That's what they do. And they don't just grab for it, but they hang on to it, shake, you know, and think about that worry. That's what that worry does to you. Can you think of one time, anybody here have a testimony about how worry has ever helped you? Anybody? No? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads saying no. Absolutely. Worry does not help us. The devil uses worry to do exactly what is described above in that definition. You know, and I'm just going to read that again. To seize by the throat with teeth and shake or mangle as one animal does another or to harass by repeated biting and snapping. So we see that worry is definitely attack on the mind from the devil. And we have a choice to make. Now, I have a study Bible I use a lot. And it defines worry as three different things. To divide into parts. It suggests a distraction. And a preoccupation causing anxiety, stress, or pressure. Everybody can attest that's what worry does to us, right? Absolutely. Nothing good. My, my Bible study also talks about 
because we're going to be going into Matthew 6, 25 through 34, some great non-worry scriptures commanding us not to worry, like when we have a worry attack coming on that we should go to every time. It says about these scriptures that they illustrate the worthlessness of worry. The worthlessness of worry. By showing that it is unnecessary, unfruitful, and unbecoming to a Christian. So worry should not be in our life. Sometimes I think as Christians, well, not as Christians, as people, but even Christians, we think worry is the thing to do. Like if we're not doing something, that worry occupies us. It gives us something to do. But I think that's a natural thing. And we see the natural world, you know, they fall into that worry. And you, you've, been, you've all been around people, and maybe you've been one of those people that think you've got to sit there and worry that that is, you know, that you're out of place if you don't. You ever been in that situation where you're around a bunch of people who are worried and you're the one that's walking in peace? You're definitely out of place, aren't you? You're definitely out of place with that group of people. So we're going to go to Matthew 6. We're going to go through 25 through 34, basically verse by verse, and, and talk about these scriptures. And she's, do, she does a lot out of the Amplified, so I'm reading these out of the Amplified. So verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious, and worried about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life greater in quality than food and the body far above and more excellent than clothing? So we look at this. She titles this verse, Is Not Life Greater Than Things? We tend to focus a lot on things in this world. Here they're focusing on, you know, Jesus is focusing on clothes and he's focusing on what we eat, okay? These, were, these are your basic needs, okay? And then shelter is a basic need too, but that can kind of fall under your finances too. And so, you know, a lot in that day, this is what Jesus was speaking to, okay? A lot of his crowd were poor people, okay? A lot of probably the majority of his crowd were poor people but the, you know so this was their worry at that time and so i always love this scripture i think we all do john 10:10 10, 10, you know that talks about the thief comes to destroy but god gave came to give us life and more abundant life so we need to remember that god has given us abundant life and abundant life is a good quality life. It doesn't necessarily mean having a lot of things. It's having good quality life. It's living life to its fullest. It's enjoying your life. Amen? As Christians, we should be enjoying our life, not letting worry. And worry will take that away from us. We can't enjoy life. We can't enjoy our day if it's full of worry. Amen? Amen. So we've got to have that quality of life. And again, you, that worry's got to be out of there. We are not to worry about anything, okay? Don't worry about a thing. That's basically what God is telling us. When he's saying, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat or drink, or what you're going to put on, okay? Basically, what he is saying right there is, you don't worry about anything, okay? These, were, these are basic needs, so he's telling us not to worry. 6, um, 26. Aren't you more valuable than a bird? How many of you here think you're more valuable than a bird? Please raise your hand, everybody, because everybody here is more valuable than a bird. Amen? Anybody here like to watch birds? Yes. Well, right here, God, Jesus is telling us, look at the birds of the air. He's telling us to do some bird watching. He says they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. How many of you have seen birds? You've seen them make a nest, but you don't really see them sowing or reaping. You don't see them planting the grain that they're going to eat in the fall. They don't do it, okay? And yet your heavenly Father keeps feeding them. He takes care of them. Are you not worth much more than they? I want that to sink in. Are you not worth much more than they? We all need to do some bird watching and think about how every time you see a bird, think about how God takes care of those birds, how he watches over them. And even to the point where Jesus used this as an illustration to show us how much he cares for us. Not to show us how much he cares for the birds, but to show us how much he cares for each and every one of us. Amen? So, what do you gain by worrying? Let's look at verse 27. 
It says, and who of you, by worrying and being anxious, can add one unit of measure or a cubit to his stature or to the span of his life? Now, I know I've already said this, but worry has no benefit to us whatsoever. And this verse definitely points that out because we can worry all day long. And what does it accomplish? Absolutely nothing. Oh, there's a song like that. It's going through my head now. (laughs) Absolutely nothing. Okay? So we don't add to our height. We don't add any value to our life. And we don't add to the years of our life. He's talking about measure, and he's talking about the span of our life. Worrying does not add any days to our life. If anything, it takes away from those days. You probably all know somebody that has worried themselves to the grave. Okay? So, worry is useless. Worry is useless. And we need to remember that every time we're tempted to worry. Now, we're going to look at 28 through 30. He says, what? Why be so anxious? And why should you be anxious about clothes? Here we go again with the basic needs. Consider the lilies of the field and learn thoroughly how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. How many of you have seen a flower working lately? Nope, not at all. They just lay out in the sun and do their thing. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his magnificence, excellence, dignity, and grace was not arrayed like one of these. Now, Solomon was considered, I believe, the richest man of the time, maybe the richest man ever, okay? And he wasn't even dressed like the flowers that God dresses. He didn't have that beauty. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and green, and tomorrow is tossed into the furnace, will he not much more surely clothe you, O you of little faith? God is trying to point out to us again how much he cares for us. He cares so much. He provides beauty and clothing for the flowers. He's going to take care of you too. Okay, Every time, he's going to take care of you. 631 says, Therefore, do not be worry. I mean, do not worry and be anxious, saying, What are we going to have to eat? Or what are we going to have to drink? Or what are we going to have to wear? I think Jesus was really trying to get his point across in these scriptures, okay? What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? And Joyce Meyer, she asked, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? She, she, she makes a statement. She says she thinks Satan sends out little demons whose job is nothing but to repeat in our ear, what are you going to do? What are you going to do about this situation you're living in right now? What are you going to do about this or that? What are you going to do about your kid who is off doing this? What are you going to do about the fact that you might lose your job tomorrow? What are you going to do? And he's just constantly, you know, that question is always in our, it can be in our ear. And our answer needs to be, I don't know yet what I'm going to do in my situation, but God does know. And that is good enough for me. He will give me direction at the right time. And that's when you just got to kind of rest in the Lord and say, he knows how this is going to be taken care of. He knows how that need is going to be met. He knows he's already speaking to somebody about that need. He's already got things in motion. We just got to rest in the Lord. Yeah, Every time, every time. And we also need to remember, and we've talked a lot about this. um, Well, we talk about this a lot, period. But in this series about how the things that are in our mind, if we think on them and dwell on them, whether good or bad, but if we dwell on worry in our mind, it's going to eventually come out of our mouth. And that's what we need to control. That's why it's important to control the worry in our mind so that it doesn't come out of our mouth. We don't need those words coming out and affecting us. Amen? One thing I've always kind of relied on is the devil. I don't believe the devil can read my mind, okay? But he can hear the words out of my mouth. So that's why it's important to control it up here before it comes out of here so that he's not hearing it because he's going to take action when he hears those negative words. Amen? 
Let's look at 32 and 33. It says, for the Gentiles or the heathen wish for and crave and diligently seek all these things. And your heavenly father knows well that you need them all. But seek, aim at, and strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. And then all these things taken together will be given you besides. So he's saying that the heathen wish for and crave and diligently seek all these things. All these things is the food and the clothes and the drink. Okay, that's what he's talking about there. That's what they seek after. And he's telling us we don't even have to seek after those things. That should not even be on our radar of thinking or seeking that what we need to seek is his righteousness. Amen? Because when we seek his righteousness, then all those things are added to us. He knows how he's going to meet those needs, and those things are added to us. The world seeks after things, but we need to seek after the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean things are wrong. We all need clothes. We all need food. We all need shelter. We all need different things. And it's not wrong to desire those things, but they shouldn't be above seeking God. God is always number one. That's who we seek. The other things are added to us. We don't have to seek after those things. We need to seek God's face. Amen? Seek is a strong word meaning to pursue, crave, and go after with all of your might. That's what we need to be doing with God, going after him with all of our might. Amen? Now, the last verse is verse 34. It says, so don't, do not worry or be anxious. Boy, we've heard that. So do not worry or be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will have worries and anxieties of its own. Sufficient for each day is its own trouble. So, like there's not enough to think about today. People want to worry about tomorrow. And so, tomorrow's going to come and God's going to take care of tomorrow just like he's going to take care of today. And again, like we've already said, does it do us any good to think about tomorrow? To worry about tomorrow? No, not a thing. We're not going to change a thing by our worry. Not a thing. We're better off believing God to take care of our tomorrow. Amen? And one thing, I'm a planner. As most of you know, I like to plan. I like to organize. But I can also find... Excuse me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but because I'm a planner and an organizer, I can find myself mapping out all the scenarios that could happen. Okay? Okay? Rick knows this well. Yeah. You know, well, if we do this, this might happen. This might, you know, if we do this, I'm, I'm just thinking. Now, some of that is sensible, okay? Some of that is wisdom. So I've had to learn that line between what I call wisdom and worry, okay? There's things that you've got to plan out. Like if you're planning something, you've got to know, well, this might happen, so we need to be prepared for this. But it can't turn into worry. That can't ever turn into worry, okay? So that I, I have to find that, you know, and know what the difference is. And then, um, you know, I was thinking as I was studying this in the last week, these scriptures about how Jesus focused on our basic needs, like clothing, food, drink, shelter, you know. He focused on, focused on those things. And I got to thinking, I said, you know, that's not my worry problem. I don't worry about things anymore as far as needs. Um, I won't say that there wasn't a time that I, I didn't do that, but I've been able to totally cast those things on the Lord. My issue of worry is my kids. And that probably is a lot with parents. You know, the devil knows, okay, <laughs> where to attack us. And we all might have different things. Or even categories where we kind of file things, you know, well, yeah, I don't worry so much about this, but boy, this is a really main thing. And I'll just give you an example, and I don't even think I've ever told Jackson this. Well, when he went to Australia, believe it or not, my child going all the way to Australia was not a worry for me. Um, I know parents. I've had to talk to parents. I, re I had a friend that years ago, her son wanted to go tur to Turkey on a mission trip, and she was totally against it because it was turkey and you know and he had went through some training and learned the dangers of going to turkey and witnessing to people in turkey and and um she was just totally against it and i had to sit her down and go but does god want him to go to turkey 
And she knew that he felt like he was called to go to Turkey on this mission trip. I said, then you've got to trust in the Lord. You've got to totally cast that care on the Lord. I never had an issue with that. No, Jackson traveled all over the world from the time he was in seven, uh, eighth grade. And that was never a worry for me. I even told him one time, he got on an airplane one time. First time, first time he flew, I think, was to Seattle. And he was going on a mission trip. But it was the first time he flew, right? Well, right along that time was a lot of the terrorist things that were happening and, and different things like that in the news. And he said, I'm, he told me before he left, he said, I'm a little nervous about flying. And I said, well, son, don't be nervous. I said, if a terrorist does come on your plane, you just get to go to heaven. <laughs> he, he didn't think that was a very reassuring word. <laughs> he said, thanks, mom. <laughs> That's really not what I was looking for. But it's just kind of how I was looking at it, you know, you know, what do we gain, you know, we just gain by something like that happening, so he didn't appreciate that. But to go back, the thing I never really told him was when he went to Australia, you know, there, there's one thing that can really cause worry in my mind is my kids driving, okay, I think they're both horrible drivers, um, that's just me thinking, okay, that's my thoughts, that's my opinion, um, I mean, I think Rick can be a horrible driver. I know I'm a horrible driver. So that was always like, you know, but he went over there and he couldn't drive. So it kind of eliminated that worry for me. Totally. But the next thing I knew, he was getting an Australian driver's license. <laughs> and I'm going, what? <laughs> now you put that back on the radar again, you know. So, you know, something to cast over on the Lord. So just different things like that, you know, that. The Lord can cause, I mean, the devil can cause us to worry about things. Um, so it doesn't do any good. Again, worry is worthless. Everybody say that with me. Worry is worthless. There's no sense in it. Don't do it. Amen? Now, I'm going to real quick, I am going to read those same scriptures out of the Passion Translation. I think. I think I have them here. No, I got it. I got it. Just want you to listen, because, uh, again, the, tra the Passion Translation, the beauty of the words they use are just amazing. And so with a scripture like this, it really comes out. This is why I tell you to never be worried about your life, for all that you need will be provided, such as food, water, clothing, everything your body needs. Isn't there more to your life than a meal? Isn't, there, isn't your body more than clothing? Consider the birds. Do you think they worry about their existence? They don't plant or reap or store up food, yet your heavenly Father provides them each with food. Aren't you much more valuable to your Father than they? So which one of you, by worrying, could add anything to your life? And why would you worry about your clothing? Look at all the beautiful flowers of the field. They don't work or toil, and yet not even Solomon in all his splendor was robed in beauty like one of these. So if God has clothed the meadow with hay, which is here for such a short time, and then dried up and burned, won't he provide for you the clothes you need, you of little faith? So then forsake your worries. Why would you say, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For, what? for that is what the unbelievers chase after. Doesn't your heavenly Father already know the things your bodies require? So above all, constantly seek God's kingdom and his righteousness then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Refuse to worry about tomorrow, but deal with each challenge that comes your way one day at a time. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Now, I'd just like to say God will take care of tomorrow because he will. So you know how I feel about the word of God. I think it has the answer for everything that goes on in our life. Okay, and it's true, whether you think that or not. The word has an answer for everything that goes on our, in our life, including, including worry and anxiety. So we're going to go through some scriptures that are good to go to if you have a worry problem. Okay? So they're good to have these scriptures handy so that if you do start to worry, you go to the word and you fortify yourself with the word. Now, a very common one is Philippians 4, 6, which says, Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. But in every circumstance and in everything, by prayer and petition, definite requests with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. Now, she didn't include verse 7, but I'm just going to read the 
very first part of verse 7, which says, and God's peace will be yours. So when you do, verse 6, when you don't fret, you don't have any anxiety, but you cast everything on the Lord, God's peace will be yours. Sounds simple, and it can be. You just got to apply it. You have to apply it. Okay, so that's a good scripture to have when you have a worry attack. So 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, Refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God and lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. We need to bring every disobedient thought into the obedience to Christ. We need to capture those thoughts. A disobedient thought is worry. Anything that goes against the word of God is a disobedient thought, and we need to bring those thoughts captive. I picture kind of a cowboy with a lasso, lassoing that worry thought or whatever that thought is and, pull, and bringing it captive, making it a prisoner, okay? So, and, and that's what I believe we can do. The word of God says we can do that. Hallelujah. That's exciting. The word is our most single effective weapon against worry. Yes, period. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite scriptures, 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 says, Therefore, humble yourselves, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt you, casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him, for he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Great scripture to memorize. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. That's the short version. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Years ago when we were in West Virginia, we were planning a kids event for Hallelujah Night. And our whole theme for this whole hour was on fear and not having fear. And we did this skit about casting your cares on the Lord. And one of the things that we emphasized was when I think about the word cast, I think about fishing because you cast a fishing rod. And so that's what we need to do with our worry and our fear. We cast it. We cast it away. But the problem with the fishing rod is, is it has a reel where you can reel it back in. Okay? You can bring it right back in. Okay? That's not what we're supposed to do. It doesn't say cast and reel it back in. It says cast it. So when we think about casting, we need to throw it out as far as we can and let it go. And let it go. Hallelujah. Cast on your, all your cares on him because he cares for you. Let it go. Don't pull it back. We have a tendency because we're natural people to pull it back. We'll say, I cast all my cares, but the next thing you know, there's that worry cropping up again. Oh, I'm going to worry about that some more. No, that's when we got to make a choice. Cast all that care on him. And I love this scripture. Joyce Meyer says she loves it too. Second Chronicles 20, 12. It says, O oh, our God, will you not exercise judgment upon them? For we have no might to stand against this great company that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. So when you don't know what to do, your eyes should be on him. We're going to go to this story in the Bible, 2 Chronicles 20. I'm going to go to this after I was studying again this week, and I was looking at this. I said, you know, this is a great story out of the Old Testament. I love stories that relate to our present day out of the Old Testament. So we're going to just read through those scriptures so you know this story, okay? Just in case you haven't ever heard of it, or it'll remind you and encourage you. I'm going to start right with verse 1. It says, It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea from Syria. So Jehoshaphat's told about an enemy that's coming, and Jehoshaphat feared. Okay, that's his first reaction. Sometimes that's our first reaction. That's okay because we can make up for it. Okay, sometimes that's our first reaction. Shouldn't be as a Christian. In Jehoshaphat's case, it was. And, but, but his second reaction was to set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. 
So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven, and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations, and in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. And that's exactly what happened. The Spirit of the Lord fell in verse 14. The Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the guys there, spoke out the word of the Lord, and said, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent or ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeril. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. So, And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be, you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And then down in verse 22, it says, Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. They didn't have to fight that battle. They were defeated because they didn't know what to do, but their eyes were on the Lord. Even though Jehoshaphat started to fear, and he had fear, he immediately went to the Lord. He immediately went to the Lord. It would be like us having that little moment of fear, that little moment of worry, and then going, I've got to go to the Word. I've got to go to the Word. If that takes fasting, I've got to do some fasting. But if you go to the word, you're going to get the answers you need. Every answer, every scripture we've read tonight is an answer to worry in your life. Worry should not dwell there. I find in the middle of the night, for some reason, I don't know why that is, but the devil loves to attack you in the middle of the night, or at least he does me with thoughts or worry. I just start praying for somebody. I just start praying for somebody else. I can speak the word, but prayer also, I just pray for somebody else. And it totally just lifts off of me, and the devil can't do nothing with that. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Okay. Um, she tells a story in here about some an artist, or two artists, who were asked to paint pictures of peace as they perceived it. Okay? We all kind of have our own picture of peace probably in our mind. What's peace to us? What's it look like? One painted a quiet, still lake far back in the mountains, the other painted a raging, rushing waterfall which had a birch tree leaning out over it with a bird resting in a nest on one of the branches. I'm going to show you a couple videos. I couldn't find this exact scenario, but we're going to play the first video just for a few seconds here. This is the kind of video you go to sleep with. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, now let's play the second video. Now you don't see under the bird because I didn't show the beginning of the video, but her babies are actually underneath her, okay? Okay, that's good. Thanks, Christina. And I just want you to find the video of um, the song Sparrows by Corey Asbury, if you don't mind. Forgot to ask you to do that. But um, so which is the true picture of peace? First picture is very peaceful. We definitely can say that's peace. But the true picture of peace is that second picture. Because the storm, the winds, and the rain is pelting that bird, but the bird is in peace taking care of her babies. Okay? At least her babies are in peace. <laughs> okay? She may not be so much in peace, but her babies are very peaceful, being protected by their mom. Okay? So I just thought that was a, a neat comparison of what peace really is. Because, you know, if we're just out la da and everything's fine in the world, you know, peace is easy. Peace is very easy. If we don't have a care in the world, everything's going right, and there's just not, nothing to worry about, it's when there is something to worry about. But we can walk in peace. That's true peace. That's true peace. When we can walk through the storm, when we can walk through our circumstances, John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I live, leave with you. My own peace I now give you and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives do I give, do I give to you. You know, Jesus' peace is the best peace there is. I love the verse. I've used this very often with dealing with different people. That it's perfect peace, but it's another scripture says, The peace that passes all understanding. And I always explain that. You know, it's just... Nobody can understand why you've got peace. It's that kind of peace that no matter what's going on in your life and people around you may know, oh, all these terrible things are happening to you right now, but you're walking in peace. You're walking in perfect peace. How is that possible? Because it's a peace that passes all understanding. I don't know. I don't know how. It's just God. It's not me. It's God. That's the peace that passes all understanding. It's, it's the trust we have in the Lord and that peace that comes from serving only him. And I love peace. Peace is good. Worry is bad. Amen? Remember, worry is worthless. So let's look at Hebrews 13.5. It says, Let your character, character or moral disposition be free from love of money, including greed, avarice, lust, and craving for earthly possessions, and be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. For he, God himself, has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down. Relax my hold on you, assuredly not. You know, they always say when God repeats something in scripture, he really wants us to get it. He's really trying to emphasize a point. And here in the Amplified Bible, you see him saying, I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you. I will not, I will not. That's good stuff. <laughs> the Bible is good stuff. And to close out, I just, I, I do, I want to pray for everybody first, and then we're going to play a song because... As I was studying last night, I realized that that song, Sparrows, and we've all heard it, just goes along so perfect with the message tonight. And I just wanted to play it before we dismiss, but I do want to pray. And if there's somebody here that is struggling with worry, struggling with anxiety, we could pray for you all night long, but it's a choice you've got to make. It's a choice you've got to make to walk in peace or to worry. Okay, God's already given us that peace. We've got to draw on it. We've got to walk in it. We've got to make that choice. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I do. I pray for each and every one here, Father God. And, 
and we may have different concerns different things that crop up in our lives father god and i pray that each one of us will learn to cast our cares on you because you care for us so much and we appreciate that so much we thank you for the peace that passes all understanding we thank you that we don't have to worry that we don't have to fret that we don't have to live in anxiety in the name of jesus lord god for anyone that's struggling i pray that they will look to you father god and make that choice to draw on that peace and to have that peace to abide in you to be in your word to live with you to live in your presence we thank you for that in jesus name amen so just stick around for just a few minutes this song's just a little over three minutes long and um just draw on the words of this song in jesus name <laughs> 